Hello friends. Welcome to the Brooklyn Knit Folk Podcast. My name is Jacqueline. You can find me on Instagram, Ravelry, pretty much anywhere as at Jacqueline Salem. This is a podcast all about knitting, sewing, whatever creative endeavors that I get up to. And thank you so much for joining me today. It has been a long time since I've posted a podcast on my YouTube channel and I'm feeling really excited and invigorated by posting on my YouTube channel again. If you didn't know, I have a Patreon account where um, I post a lot of a lot of things, really everything that I want to. It's kind of the reason I started that to begin with so I could have a space that could has a lot of different types of content and uh, recipes that I would post, PDFs and instructionals that I could upload, vlogs and other kinds of videos. And I started kind of started up the podcast again over on Patreon since earlier this year. But it just didn't feel right to post podcasts on Patreon and not on my YouTube channel. I don't know. It just felt it felt strange. So, so toward the end of last month, I made a decision that I wanted to post uh, all of my video content onto YouTube for everybody to see going forward. It just didn't feel right gatekeeping access to content and I love Patreon not dogging it in any way like I, I love Patreon I support a lot of people on Patreon and I love to do that but for me personally it just didn't feel right to post my podcast there anymore so I'm putting it back on my YouTube channel um, and I let my patrons know that that's how it would be going forward and now I use Patreon just as a way to give little extras, behind the scenes photos, photo essays, occasional um, recipes. So the content amount is probably going to be decreasing over there just for like little extras and snippets. It's a way to financially support me if that's something that you uh, feel moved to do. And thank you so much. It really makes it possible to produce content like this for my YouTube channel for everybody to see. So thank you so much. Uh, to my lovely patrons who are able to do that. And thank you so much for your support and for watching this. So um, yeah, if this is your first time watching, hello, um, my name is Jacqueline. Like I said, I live in Brooklyn, New York City with my boyfriend, Andrew, and my two cats. And it's just the perfect thing for me. I love living in Brooklyn. Um, I love New York City life. I love having, you know, all of these amazing, well, not right now, I guess, because of coronavirus. Gosh, I mean, stay home, stay safe, wear a mask if you go out in public, the whole nine yards. Um, yeah, so luckily it seems to be uh, decreasing or flattening the curve, the number of cases in New York, but it's spiking around the country. So stay safe out there. But yeah, so I live in Brooklyn, New York and it's like the perfect place for me um and i'm sure most of you watching this already know that and have been watching me you know for some time but yes i am in my new apartment now andrew and i moved in together last january and we live in uh prospect park or not in prospect park that's the park we live close to prospect park which is amazing because i have such a great huge park right outside my doorstep and it's been amazing. I love my new apartment. The cats love the new apartment. They have all of the space. There's a huge long hallway that they love to run up and down when their feeder goes off. They are um, sizable <laughs> pets, but yes. So I love it here. It's amazing. I have my own craft room, which is like a first for me and something I never thought I would be able to have living in Brooklyn. I'm so lucky and I know that and I thank my lucky stars that I can have this space every day. And Andrew is just such a gem. He makes it so wonderful for me. I keep looking over there because it's right over there. He makes it so wonderful for me. He's built me a wall desk. He's going to build me my dream PDF pattern storage uh, today. So. At some point, I will definitely do a craft room tour for you guys because I love seeing craft rooms. Uh, Kristen of the Woolen Vine podcast recently posted hers and um, Kayla from Marissa made her Instagram and she also has a Patreon that I subscribe to. She just posted one on uh, her Instagram, I think on Instagram TV maybe, but yeah, so I love seeing 
how other people organize their craft room. So I definitely want to do that once I kind of get it more into shape to actually show you things that might be useful for you. So that will be coming. So stay tuned for that. But today I just kind of want to catch you up on my projects that I'm currently working on. Um, it's my goal to podcast every two weeks as I did when I had Brooklyn Knit Folk more regularly, but we'll see how it goes. So knitting. Let's start with the knitting and the yarn projects. So knitting, I have to say, has something, is something that's kind of not fallen off my radar, but it's definitely not something I do nearly as much as I used to, and used to meaning pre-coronavirus uh, outbreak in New York. And that's because knitting for me is so situational. So whenever I knit, it's usually to and from work on the subway and on my lunch break while I'm at work. Now those things are removed because of course we're all working from home, which is little, like very lucky for me. So I don't really have that built in knitting time that I used to have anymore. For a while I was trying to get up earlier to have that time to use for knitting and I do actually get up earlier. I wake up, I don't know, around 7 every day and I don't start my work day until 9.30. But um, I've ended up using that time for reading or going to my garden and yeah, so I just kind of have to follow whatever whims make sense for me at the time and right now knitting is just not like where the force of my crafting mojo is coming from. I do still have a few craft, um, knitting craft projects to show you, but it's not like my main jam at the moment, but I'll still catch you up on what I've been working on. Um, this one is a shawl design Ooh. and it doesn't look like much right now but um, I'm very excited about it very excited about it this uh, is knit using uh, Stacy Elstone stress knits yarn in her Dahlia colorway for a while I did consider potentially making this a mystery knit along because I think it is constructed in such a way that would be perfect for a mystery knit along, but I mean, I feel like most people don't really like mystery knit alongs and would rather just see a pattern before they start knitting it, or at least I'm that way. So um, with the exception of Helen Stewart and uh, Stephen West. I think they both do mystery knit alongs really well. Or if Melody Hoffman, B Mandarins did a mystery knit along, I would probably do that one too. But um, yeah, so I don't think I'm going to make it a mystery knit along anymore, but I will show you the progress as I get on with it. And right now I'm knitting a, uh, not brioche, I forget what the stitch is called. I don't even know what it's called actually, but it's the same one that is used for that headband pattern that I knit late last year. It's all knitting, no purling, using one strand of yarn. And I don't know what it's called, but it looks like brioche, even though it's not. And it's so easy because there's no purling in it. So I'm very excited about how simple this is and how um, intuitive it is so far. It's gonna be a brioche, even though it's not, um, whatever this kind of textured rib square, it's gonna be a square. So I'm about, I don't know, maybe 40% of the way finished with this part and before I start the next part of the shawl. And like I said, this is Stress Knits yarn in the Dahlia colorway. And I just love it. It's on her favorite base, which is an 80-20 uh, superwash merino and nylon yarn. Very squishy very soft and it's in a project bag that was given to me by bed of roses a norwegian project bag and stitch marker maker uh, love this bag love this yarn love this project i haven't worked on it though in quite some time like with everything i really want to work on it i'm going to say that probably a million times but i just i work on what feels interesting to me at the time My next project is a crochet project and this is a produce bag. It's a free pattern when you sign up for a newsletter from, I believe it's We Are Knitters. I think it's them. I'll put it on the screen for sure. 
and um, I think it's called the Edda bag. Again, I'll put it on the screen so you know, but it's a crochet project and on my path to being, um, to living a more sustainable life, of course we always bring our own bags for grocery shopping when we go grocery shopping, but I would like to take it a step further and even make my own produce bags for like loose items because we try not to use like the plastic as much as possible, even within the grocery. So this is going to be for that. And it's fairly simple. I had to look up the stitches that it calls to do, but if you can crochet the granny stripe blanket, then you'll be fine learning how to crochet this. And I'm using for this project Knit Picks Dishy, which is their cotton yarn. My camera will focus, maybe. No? Okay. No focusing, I guess not. Um, Knit Picks Dishy in the linen colorway. And I also bought like a lime green color that's called, I think it's called the honeydew color because I want to crochet um, at least three of these produce bags. I haven't made a ton of progress on this since when I started it. This was my like get up in the morning attempt, getting up earlier in the morning to attempt to work on some sort of knitting or crochet project when I started doing that and then I just kind of stopped using that time for that so again I want to pick this back up. Crochet is so fast. It uses a lot of yarn though but it is very fast and I would definitely recommend Knit Picks Dishy if you're looking for a worsted weight cotton yarn because it is incredibly soft very soft and also very affordable because Knit Picks is so affordable. So skip the sugar and cream that you can get at Joann's or Michael's and go for Knit Picks Dishy. I think it's around the same price and such better quality and way more colors too. So I would definitely recommend. So that again is whatever the free produce bag is. I think it's called the Etta bag. I think from We Are Knitters. I'll put it on the screen if I haven't already. Two more knitting projects to share with you. The next one is a sock. This is in a bag that uh, Dawn, my friend Dawn made for me. I love it. That's where I put a lot of my uh, pins. I have this one that says Plant Mommy that my friend Simon made for me and this little diamond one. She embroidered, Dawn embroidered this uh, beautiful little tulip on the corner there. And I am knitting a sock for Andrew, just a vanilla sock, nothing too crazy, although I have considered uh, adding a stitch pattern to it just because I haven't knit Andrew any socks that have a pattern on them. I've only knit him vanilla socks. He wears the socks that I have knit him so much. It makes me feel so good, but he genuinely loves them. He's very cold natured, so um, he's constantly wearing these around the house and especially in winter. So even, even now in the summer though, still wears them, which makes me feel so good. So since he's such a knit worthy person because he both loves it and because I love him, he um, is getting another pair of socks. And this is the Folklore colorway by Grenuico. And this was the advent day skein in her advent calendar last year. It's got a lot of these kind of swampy greens, chartreuses, navy, some rust in there occasionally. It's really, really pretty. So yeah, just my basic vanilla sock recipe, except I have um, added additional stitches for a man's foot. Typically I knit my socks for myself on size US zero, two millimeter, um, 64 stitches, an eight or nine inch leg, a fish lips kiss heel, and then my recipe for a rounded toe. Um, but for Andrew socks, I kick it up to 64, or not 64, uh, 68 stitches for his. And that seems to work really well. Here's how it's knitting up, in case you're curious. Really pretty. So just a plain vanilla sock. I 
And then my last project is one that I cast on on the inaugural knit night at Brooklyn General Store. So Brooklyn General is my local yarn shop. One of a few actually that I have access to. Argyle is the other one. The one that's technically closest to me is Argyle, but Brooklyn General is the one I go to the most because my friends work there and because they started that knit night and I just have a really great time. So they started this knit night. It was either like the beginning of this year or the end of last year. I think it was the beginning of this year. I can't remember for sure. But I cast on this sweater at the inaugural Brooklyn General Knit Night. It's inside out right now because I'm knitting a uh, reverse stockinette. And I have finished the body and I'm working on the first sleeve right now, which I'm going to knit at a three quarter length sleeve. This is the Astragal sweater. And I don't know how to pronounce her name, so I'll be sure to put it on the screen for you to see, but um, I believe it's Anir Birkenbayeva. Don't know for sure. Sorry about that. Um, it's a pom-pom quarterly design. And I saw my friend Marilisa of the Girl Meets Yarn podcast knitting it, and I fell in love with hers, so I decided to knit one. I love the yoke on it. It kind of reminds me of a cross section of onions or figs. And this kind of like starburst out from the neckline. And then it flows into plain reverse stockinette. And then the bottom has this really cool angled rib for the bottom rib. And I think it's so pretty. I love this sweater so, so much. I'm using Brooklyn Tweed Loft in the wool socks colorway. The pattern does call for DK weight yarn, but I knit my White Horse sweater, a pattern by Caitlin Hunter, um, also designed for DK weight yarn in Brooklyn Tweed Loft, and it worked out perfectly. It's my best fitting sweater. So I decided to do the exact same thing for my um, Astragal sweater, and lo and behold, the stitch count around the body was the exact same in the size that I was knitting as the White Horse sweater I knit. So I was like, oh, this is going to be great. I don't know what happened between when I started, when I, between knitting this one and when I knit the White Horse sweater. I'm already a fairly loose knitter, but I'm using the same yarn and the same needles and the same body stitch circumference. And somehow this one has ended up with a lot more positive ease than my white horse sweater did, which is such a disappointment because I was not wanting this to be a loose fitting sweater. And I don't really want to rip it out because it's taken me so long to knit this already because I'm just like slow with knitting right now. So I don't know. I'm hoping um, maybe I can kind of block it and then throw it in the dryer for a little bit to kind of draw it in just a little bit. I've done that before a few times and it's worked out okay, but we'll see. So my, I'm already, like I said, a looser knitter, so I just must have really loosened up even more when knitting this. I don't know. It's a big old question mark for me. But anyway, I'm in the process of knitting the sleeves right now, and I'm not really following the pattern anymore. I'm just going to kind of try it on and decrease, try it on, decrease, try it on, decrease until I get to um, the bottom of the sleeve, and I'll do this kind of one-by-one one twisted rib. I don't know that I'll do it in this kind of angled one on the sleeve, too. I think that might be too much. I'll just do a plain twisted rib on the bottom of a three-quarter length sleeve which is my preferred sleeve length of choice. I think long sleeves are nice depending on what kind of sweater it is. If it's a really oversized comfy cardigan, then I kind of like having full length sleeves, but for more fitted or fashion sweaters, I prefer the three quarter length sleeve. It just kind of gives it a more, I don't know, light touch feeling to it. It just feels pretty to me. So again, this is the Astragal sweater by Anir Birkenbayeva for Pom Pom Quarterly, and I'm knitting it in Brooklyn Tweed Loft in the Wool Socks colorway. Oh, and check out the stitch marker. Still one of my all-time favorites. I'm telling you, Tilting Planet does the best stitch markers to this day. Love them, this little pink puffball.
And that's in a project bag that came with the advent calendar for uh, stress knits last year. And I've been using that for my sweater project bag. I love drawstring project bags. They are my favorite style of project bag. And that is it for all of my knitting projects. So I'm going to start talking about sewing now. There's a lot. Oh, where to start, where to start. I guess I'll just go through the pile as it is in front of me, not necessarily in chronological order. Um, there are a few recently finished objects, the first of which is the Agnes top by Tilly and the Buttons. If you follow me on Instagram, I did sew this top from start to finish in excruciating detail, probably. If you're wanting to learn how to sew and you feel overwhelmed by the sewing process, go watch the highlight that I saved on my profile for the Agnes top. I think it's called Beginner Sewing or something like that. Tilly and the Buttons is a really great pattern designer for people who are just getting into sewing because her instructions are very thorough, very clear, and the techniques that she uses in the patterns that I've made so far are very straightforward, very clear, nothing that's like really too complicated. Um, so if you're looking for a good beginner project or a first knits project, knits are the stretchy ones as opposed to wovens, which are the non-stretchy fabrics, this is a great first pattern for you and super wearable. Come on, who, who of us does not have a top like this from ready to wear in our closet? We all do. We all have this top in our closet somewhere, like some sort of like stretchy knit t-shirt. And there are a lot of cute variations. There's like a little scrunched up center. There's a ruched sleeve option, which was the first one that I made. This is my second time making this top. And I love it so much. It's so cute. So yes, Tilly and the Buttons, Agnes Top. The fabric is from my latest obsession, um, Blackbird Fabrics. If you have not heard of Blackbird Fabrics or are not shopping with them, oh my gosh, you must give them a follow on Instagram, shop on their website. They just have the most beautiful curation of fabrics for apparel. So they don't do things like quilting cotton or anything like that. This is like mainly for people who want to make clothing, but the selection is really, really good. And the prices are extremely reasonable in my opinion. It's not as cheap as like uh, fabric.com or inexpensive, I should say. It's not as inexpensive as fabric.com is, but uh, the curation, the quality is like really exceptional. Blackbird Fabrics, look them up. I'm also a big fan of their ethics and the way that they run their business, so that's really important to me right now. So I bought this stripe knit from Blackbird Fabrics, and it's this really pretty kind of cream color background with these rust and kind of royal blue, navy bluish stripes. So cute. I love it so much. I cut the neckline in such a way that only the cream shows. I originally had it cut so that the stripes like kind of showed around the edge and it was just a little too much for me. I needed something a little more understated for my personal style. And yeah, it's just like a dream to sew. The hardest part probably of all of it is inserting the neckband, but you know, with pins, slow and steady, you've got this. So again, beginner sewists would definitely recommend this project. And if you are new, so new to sewing that you like don't know how to thread your machine or make a bobbin, um, several years ago, I made a tutorial series for how to make your own quilt. And in part five of that series, there's a whole video dedicated to machine prep and how to thread a sewing machine. So if you can't remember or don't have your manual or it's just not like clicking with you by looking at the manual, go find um, part five of the Brooklyn Knit Folk Quilt Along video tutorial series. And it's all in there, a video tutorial showing you how to thread your machine. And then tag me in your project because I really want to see it. All right, next 
project. This is my latest favorite pattern. So if you know me, you know there is one pattern I make the most and it happens to be the one I'm wearing and I use it again in this another one that's in front of me. It is McCall's M6955. I use the hell out of this pattern, mostly to hack the bodice and the skirt actually. I use both. I use both of it and I use them to hack other patterns to achieve new looks with this same pattern. I've permanently altered this pattern. So I've permanently altered this pattern. This right here is just kind of a scoop neck bodice. I've permanently altered it to be a square neck top now because that's what I prefer. But um, yeah, I love this pattern. The first time I made it was just such a game changer for me. It's that kind of like green blue dress with the crisscross back that I wear constantly. That was the first time that I ever made this pattern and I still wear that dress constantly and I made it over two years ago now. So that pattern was a real win for me. But the second most used pattern that I have in my stash is now the Etoile Dress by French Poetry Patterns. I don't know what it is about, I mean, I guess, I mean, I know what it is. It's their fit model and the proportions of their fit model work really well for my body shape. I can never cut just like a straight size from French poetry patterns. I always have to blend between one size and the top, whatever the 36 inch bust is, and then whatever the 31 inch waist is. I always have to grade between those two sizes. But once I do that, it's smooth sailing. I can sew the pattern as is once I true up between the two sizes, and then it fits perfectly. The height, the circumference of like the armhole, the length of the bodices. I never have, I haven't had to shorten any bodices yet. I almost always have to shorten my bodices because my waist is higher, I guess, than the average uh, pattern. But yeah, French poetry patterns just work really well for my body shape. I'm also a pear body shape, which is why I have to grade between two sizes constantly. That's like an alteration I make in almost every single uh, pattern that I sew. And this one was no exception. It's a V-neck button down dress made out of a viscose poplin from Blackbird Fabrics. Told you, my obsession with them is real. It's this kind of navy background and it has these flowers these kind of abstract little white blob flowers with a light blue dot and a light blue stem coming from them. And if you look closely, you can see there's like a pattern within a pattern. You can see it's kind of striped in it. This one's the same way. This one's also from Blackbird Fabrics. And I just, yeah, I just love this dress. It has a gathered sleeve. I don't know if you're gonna be able to see that very well, but yeah, it has a gathered sleeve. And the pattern is originally designed to have ties on the sleeve on the bottom of it, but um, those ties are cut on bias and I have enough fabric left over after cutting every other piece except for the ties to make something else out of it, like a shirt. So I decided to omit the ties for this version of the Etoile dress so that I could conserve fabric and I just sewed it as like a fluted sleeve and I love the result. I wear this all the time. All the time. It has two front long waist darts and the same in the back, two long back waist darts. Um, it is a shorter dress. I didn't change the length of it and it's a really great summer short dress for me. Could not be happier with this design. Uh, the one thing I will say about it is, uh, to, well, I guess a couple um, complaints, if you will. Uh, French poetry patterns are not very size inclusive. I think for my waist, I sew the second or third, I can't remember, to the largest size, and I have a 31 inch waist. So not super size inclusive. I have uh, gotten in touch with them uh, by like kind of 
mentioning them about this in my Instagram stories so they know it's on their radar that I would like hope that they are going to extend that sizing range so that more people could produce or yeah more people can make their patterns I mean really it's only in their best interest and everybody's interest and it's just the fair and right thing to do so um, I have gotten in touch with them about their size inclusivity we'll see if they if anything comes of it and then the second thing is that the graphic design on their pattern pieces leaves a little bit to be desired. It's the first time I've ever seen it, but the pattern pieces themselves don't have the pattern company name or the pattern name on it. It has like a number and then it will say back, cut to, you know, like all the other usual information, but it doesn't have uh, French poetry or etoile dress on it. And I mean, these pattern companies have to know that we are making, that we buy tons of patterns, right? I mean, I'm sure we have plenty of patterns to be keeping up with, or at least I do. So it really would be helpful if they printed that information on every single pattern piece. I mean, I, when I get it, I just write it on it so it's like not a big deal. But if there are any pattern designers out there um, or aspiring pattern designers, just make sure that you're putting that kind of information onto each pattern piece. It makes it easier for the home sewist to hold on to. Uh, the patterns and know what they are. And then the second thing about the graphic design on the patterns is that they don't print the size numbers on the pattern pieces themselves. So each line, each cut line for each size is a different style line, which is typical. And they have a key on the first page of the pattern, uh, but they don't print the sizes on the actual pattern pieces. So I have to keep like referring back like, oh, which one is mine again? Which one is mine again? So it's just easier if the pattern numbers in addition to the key are printed on the pattern pages or not the pattern pages on the pattern pieces so that you know which size you are cutting without a doubt but other than that it's fantastic and the construction method was really smooth sailing for this really really loved it long waist darts i'm finding are something that are really good for my body shape i made the kielo dress by named clothing recently and there are long waist darts on the back of that dress and that dress fits me like a dream so i'm finding that with my body shape the long waist darts are really good for for me And again, that was the Etoile dress, a pattern by French Poetry. And you're about to hear about it again, because I used the Etoile, Etoile dress a second time to hack what I'm calling my Monet dress or my Impressionist picnic dress. So I had this really beautiful fabric in stash that I got from Grace, my friend Weezer Dreams on Instagram, and my former neighbor. I miss you, Grace. Uh, she was destashing a bunch of her fabric and destashed this gorgeous light blue kind of cottony number, and it has this embroidered border print on it. So pretty. When I saw this, I immediately thought, impressionist it just looks very impressionist or victorian and so i had it in my head that i was going to sew the etoile dress with a lengthened etoile dress with a gathered tear along the bottom and that's what i did so i used the same pattern as i used for the etoile dress i mean it is the etoile dress this time even with the tie sleeves same modifications I made before, starting with whatever the 36 inch bust size is and then grading it out to the 31 inch waist. And then taking a ruler on the pattern pieces for the front and for the back, I just kind of followed along the trajectory of the side seam and lengthened it seven inches. Stand up so you can see. Lengthened it seven inches because I knew that I wanted this gathered tier. I forget exactly how long this is. I want to say it's like 14 inches or something like that, but I had a predetermined amount of length that I needed and then just kind of did the math to figure out first how long I wanted the gathered tier, the height of the gathered tier, how high I wanted that to be. 
and then um, figured out the distance between that and the length of the current etoile dress to discover that I needed seven inches. So I just kind of followed with a ruler out seven inches and then marked it, marked it, marked it, and then cut a longer etoile dress. So that was step one. And then step two is the gathered tier. Now, if you are a patron, you've already heard this spiel, but I think it's really useful knowledge to have, so I'm gonna share it here again. When you are adding a gathered tier or gathered ruffle to the bottom of a skirt, or really just a gathered anything, we'll start there. Gathering is done um, almost always at either one and a half, 1.75, or two times the amount of the piece it is fitting into. So for example, if I have the bottom of my skirt here, say the gathered tier was not on here, I just have the circumference of my skirt bottom, I would decide to cut my tier length based on how gathered I'd want it to be at either one and a half times the circumference of the skirt for a slightly gathered look, which is what you see here, or if I wanted a very gathered tier added to it, I would take the circumference of the skirt and multiply that times two, and that's how long I would cut the rectangle to gather to the bottom of the skirt. So again, if you want something just slightly gathered, this is done at one and a half times the circumference. If you want something super gathered, then you could gather it at about two times. Anything more than that is gonna be probably too bunchy. So yeah, that's a tip I picked up from Grace. Thank you very much. And I use that a lot. And I'll be showing you in this dress because I used it with this one too. So yeah, I gathered um, a long rectangle at one and a half times. I measured the bottom of the skirt, multiplied that amount times one and a half. Again, the bottom of the skirt meaning the entire thing, like both sides, not just the front of it. So that uh, length times one and a half, cut my rectangle, and then gathered it to the bottom of the skirt. And because I cut this on the selvage, I didn't even hem it, and it looks fine. So yeah, I just love how this turned out. I bought buttons uh, especially for it from, I don't know, some button retailer online. I just looked up wooden buttons. They weren't actually what I was expecting them to be. I thought I was getting some sort of like light tortoise shell button and they ended up being this kind of like wooden, light wood. But I actually think it worked out perfectly. I think it even suits the dress even more. And it's got my label in it like all of my clothing does. These are from Dutch Label Shop. They sent me these last year. Well, they contacted me and asked if I wanted to try some to share with you guys. And I said yes, because that's something that fits into the content that I share. And I love them. I actually just found them. So they sent them to me last year. And when I moved, I just found them in a drawer when I was moving. And I was like, oh yeah, I forgot about these. I need to use them. And I've been loving them ever since. They just add such a pizzazz. It's just so cool to like see your own label in the clothes that you make. So I would definitely recommend them. Again, Dutch label shop. And again, at 12 dress, French poetry patterns. Three more sewing projects to talk about. Oh, I know you guys love this one. Excuse how wrinkly it is. It was kind of crumpled up on my floor because I've worn it so much lately and it needs to be washed. So this was a pattern hack within an inch of its life, similar to this one, we'll get to this in a second, dress um, that was 100% inspired by flutter sleeves. I knew that I wanted these flutter sleeves. I wish that I had enough fabric in this to cut a maxi length dress, but alas, I only ordered, I think like three and a half yards and that was not enough to have the, maybe four, I can't remember, but not enough to have a maxi uh, length skirt. 
and the flutter sleeves. These flutter sleeves eat up fabric. I think they probably took like three quarters of a yard just in the sleeves, but come on, they are so worth it. This fabric is from fabric.com. Um, I did a search after sewing my etoile dress for viscose poplin on fabric.com because uh, that fabric I think is just so well suited for dresses. It's lightweight and breezy and heavy enough to like hold its shape, but it's extremely fluid drape. This is not for structured garments. It's perfect for summer dresses though. So viscose poplin, I did a search for viscose poplin on fabric.com and it came up with this rayon poplin in this gorgeous red floral print. And it has it, they have it in other colors too. I think there's like a mustard and maybe a navy um, version. And I saw it and I knew I had to have it. It was love at first sight. Got the fabric, it was just as amazing in person as it looked online. And set to work designing a pattern. So I hardly ever have indecision. Like I don't, I don't feel pressure to um, cut into fabric. I never make muslins. It's just not for me. You know, if you do it, great, amazing. But I just don't have the patience for it and I just wanna sew stuff I'm actually going to wear. So um, I had, for the first time in my life, some indecision about what to make with this fabric because it's so pretty, right? Like, I love it. I love it so much that so I was like, I have to do it justice. And I knew I wanted this flutter sleeve, but I didn't know anything else, basically. So I turned to my favorite, my favorite, favorite, McCall's M6955 for this square neck bodice that I always use. Um, and then, rather than just taking the sleeve outright, because I knew I had this flutter sleeve from Vogue 9251, see on the this one there there's a flutter sleeve on it it's a shorter flutter sleeve though rather than just taking it outright and sewing it to m6955 i laid the bodice patterns on top of one another to make sure that the sleeve fit into the sleeve cap i kind of made the armhole the same as this one so i kind of took the armhole since this was the sleeve I was using, I took the armhole from this bodice and traced it onto the M6955 and kind of made a new pattern piece for the armhole to make sure that the sleeve would fit properly into the bodice. And that worked like a charm. So that is this right here, essentially. So it was essentially the same for most of it, this kind of bottom line that you might be able to see right here. This was M6955, but the Vogue pattern with the sleeve had this much kind of added to it. So I just kind of drew the addition and taped this to my McCall's bodice pattern and then cut it the same everywhere else. So like the square neck and everything was the same over here, the, you know, the bottom of it, everything else was the same, but just made sure that when I cut the armhole that I cut this kind of new pattern piece armhole so that it matched up to uh, the Vogue pattern. So that way I knew the sleeve would fit. And then for the sleeve, um, like I said, the Vogue pattern sleeve is quite short. It's like up here or so. And I wanted these to be super long flutter sleeves to kind of match my inspiration dress, which was a Cezanne dress. Cezanne is a French clothing brand that I just love. I love everything that they have. And the inspiration dress had these longer flutter sleeves, so I wanted to also cut longer flutter sleeves. So I measured out from the edge of the pattern piece for the flutter sleeve, I think five inches because uh, that was the maximum I could extend it and cut to at the same time. So I measured out five inches all the way around, cut it all the way around, and that is the pattern that I see that you see here. Something I do think is a little bit weird that my friend Grace has addressed in her stories when she's made this dress is that the sleeve is shorter on the outside of the arm and longer underneath your arm. I, and I remember specifically that she, when she uh, sewed this pattern, that she extended the sleeve out a little bit so that it was the same all the way around. You can see it's longer down here and it's kind of more in my armpit, more fabric down here. She extended that and I forgot about that, but I wish I had remembered 
because um, I do think it's like a little bit strange that it's shorter up here. It's not a huge deal, but just something that I noticed. And then from there, I watched a YouTube tutorial on how to cut a half circle skirt. So the McCall's pattern uses a full circle skirt. I love full circle skirts. They're great for pear shaped bodies because they kind of add more fabric volume in the area where my hips are largest. Super flattering on pear shaped bodies. Love the full circle skirt, but they take a lot of fabric to make, like a lot. So I thought for the first time I would give a half circle skirt a try and oh my gosh, it is my new favorite. I mean, quite literally, it uses half of the fabric because it's a half circle and not a full circle. And there is plenty of volume in it to kind of give it that swish and really like um, more volume where you want it. So I think half circle is my new favorite. Um, again, I just kind of looked up on YouTube how to do a half, how to draft your own half circle skirt. And I felt, I'll put the link in the description box below of the tutorial that I used, but it was so great. So I just cut the half circle skirt and then constructed the bodice as I normally would for M6955. Added the sleeves and then added the skirt. And then of course the zip and the hook and eye in the back and the result turned out so cute I posted a photo on my Instagram and it's been one of my most popular posts this year you guys loved this dress when you were seeing snippets of it in my Instagram stories I can totally see why it's such a showstopper I love the floral I love the fabric I love the pattern it all just like really came together and one thing too that I wanted to mention before I forget, the last thing I'll say about this dress because I'm gushing, I love it so much. It's definitely one of my favorites that I've made in uh, the past month or so. Um, when you cut a low uh, bodice front, you have to balance that with the back. So you can't have a low front and a low back or this will start falling off your shoulders. Like this one is almost kind of trying to do. I put a piece, a crossbar piece in the back here um, to mitigate that, like, and it was part of the design. But for this one, I cut it a little too low in the back to stay on my shoulders. It keeps trying to fall off. So to get around that, I bought these snaps and attach it to some ribbon and this way I can attach it to my bra. So I just kind of put the bra, put it through the bra strap, snap it on, and then it holds on to my shoulders because it's clipped onto my bra strap. So that being said, I do have to wear a bra with this and I don't like necessarily when I have to wear a bra with certain garments. I prefer to have the option if I want to or not, but with this one it's not an option because it will fall off my shoulders if I don't or if there's nothing to clip it onto. So that's like the one downside of this dress, but small price to pay for how cute it is. I don't know if you want to see the insides. I tend to use my serger for like everything to finish the insides. Look at this, this, this sleeve. It gets me every time. It's so cool. And the slightest gusts of wind like blow out the sleeves and blow out the dress. There's the insides. Nice and neat. Oh, I utilized the salvage in parts of it so that I didn't have to finish parts of it. So yeah, I try to use salvage whenever possible and then kind of serge the insides to keep it nice and neat. Oh, and another plus about the half circle skirt, so the slightest gust of wind for a full circle will like, it exposes you. But something about the half circle, I guess just the amount of fabric, it doesn't like, with the smallest gust of wind, it doesn't like blow it up all the way. It kind of still keeps it down and around my hips. So that's another two thumbs up for the half circle skirt. Okay, and then two more, three more projects. Sorry, there's a lot of sewing. If you can't tell, I've been very into sewing. So the next one is this one that I'm wearing. 
This is another pattern hacked amazingness that I just love. I used a combo of my two favorite patterns, McCall's M6955 for neckline. I use the Etoile dress to inform the button up center front. Also the darts on it. Um, the Etoile dress is one long, like two, like a front, a front, and then one back piece for the skirt or for the dress. Um, this one I added a waistline to it and then cut the Etoile dress extra short so that I could add these gathered tiers, which you're not gonna be able to see very well because the fabric is so dark, but added gathered tiers, uh, four in total, including the top one, to the bottom of the skirt using the method that I described to you for my Impressionist Picnic Monet dress. So it's kind of, honestly, I don't know if I could explain this very well if I tried. I this is by far the most pattern hacking and changing up I've ever done to a dress. Honestly, I feel like it's even too difficult to kind of explain what I did rather than just kind of show you. Um, but I love the back of it. There's no zip here because it's a button up front. And this kind of crossbar piece right here helps keep it on my shoulders, although it does tend to want to like slide off a little bit, but not an, not enough to where it's an annoyance, but you've probably seen me kind of like tugging the straps back up. So it does like try to slip a little bit, but it doesn't like slip off entirely. I don't care. I love it so much. I love this dress. I also posted a photo of this on my Instagram. All of the gathered tears make it super swishy. It's like so swishy. Love it. And then the fabric is um, a viscose poplin from Blackbird Fabrics. And the buttons were from Etsy. They're like these mauve shank buttons. And I love it. I love it. I really don't know what more there is to say about this. I mean, the gathered tiers I did in the same way that I did my Impressionist Picnic dress. So the circumference of each tier. So I measured the bottom of this and then cut a rectangle one and a half times the length of the circumference of the first tier, and then repeated that again for the second one, measured the circumference around tier two, multiplied that times one and a half, added that tier, and then did the same for so on and so forth. So there's a total of four gathered tiers. Each um, tier, let's see, the top three tiers are 11 inches tall, maybe 10, 10 inches tall, and then the bottom tier is five inches tall. And I just finished it kind of in my usual surge turn under. And I love it. The buttons do go all the way to the bottom, although I end up actually keeping the bottom three or so unbuttoned just to kind of give it even more flair. And it's just the perfect dress for summer. It's like not too fitted where it's like sticking on my body. There's like enough space in it, but it's so light and breathable and comfortable. And ugh, I love this dress. I've worn it two times since I finished it. And that was three days ago. So I think that gives you a little bit of an indication about how much I love this dress. <sighs> love it. So yeah, I mean, maybe I should like design a pattern for it. I wouldn't know the first thing about doing that though, to be honest, but yeah, really, really love it. And then the back, like I said, it's just one of my favorite features. I hope you can see it. It's kind of crossbar piece here, um, the low back bottom. It's a dream piece, bucket list item in my wardrobe and I will get so much wear out of it, I already know. Okay, the last two things that I want to share with you, um, again, both sewing projects. One of them is a home sewing project, and another one is an in-progress dress project. So, another French poetry pattern. We have the loon dress. I'll put a picture of my inspiration dress in here for you to see. But I had no patterns like this in my stash that were kind of constructed with the uh, bodice this way. So I did a search and found that my beloved French poetry had a pattern that has 
this kind of construction. Snapped it up immediately, bought it, had it printed at One Stop Blueprinting in Brooklyn, and then set to cutting with this rayon chalet uh, in a kind of crimson color. I think it's the Telio Viscose Rayon Chalet from Fabric.com. And it is not the easiest fabric to sew with. I will say that. It's very, very, it's like fluid drape, very slippery. It's like sewing with silk. You have to treat it in the same way. So this is a very advanced fabric, I think, to work with. Uh, I have to go very slow, pin everything. Everything I'm having to like ease in and use tons of pins. It's not my usual kind of sewing, but it's making for a really high payoff, I think, because it just looks so nice. Um, I've been sewing this one in my Instagram stories. You can follow that there if you're interested. I have saved everything in a highlight called the Loon Dress Highlight. At the time of this, I'll probably delete the highlight, I don't know, in a couple months or so. And I just love how it's turning out. I did alter the back. The original, I'll zip it up, is a v-neck back. But I don't really like v-neck backs. It's just not my style. They're 250s for me. So I changed it to a square neck back. And there's still a little gap at the top because I have to add the hook and eye. So I changed it to a square back. But everything else is pretty much the same. So I'm at the part now where I'm going to be adding the sleeves, if I so choose. I can't decide if I want to add them now. After seeing it, I really like the dress as is, so maybe, and it's already finished because it's a lined bodice, so maybe I just won't add the sleeves, I don't know. I do know that I want to add a waist tie to it. I couldn't decide whether I wanted to set it into the side seams on either side, or if I wanted to do one long tie that I would just tie manually. For now, I'm opting for the manual, like, detachable tie because then I have the option of whether or not I want to use it. Um, if it's attached to the side seams, then I don't have the option. I have to use it. So I feel like it will give me a little more versatility to make it as a separate. But maybe I'll add some belt loops or something. I, I don't know. We'll see. And I did have enough fabric to cut the maxi version uh, with some finagling. Like, I only had, I think three yards, maybe three and a half yards of this fabric, um, but it did mean that it kind of like cut off the bottom of my pattern, like my front pattern piece, like the pattern piece here would have extended straight out and I kind of didn't, I didn't have enough. But that's such a small amount, like who's gonna, who's gonna see that on a, with the volume of the skirt swishing around? And I'm still not sure if I even want to do a long dress. I had envisioned this as a short dress actually, but then I couldn't decide once I had the fabric for it, so I went ahead and cut the long one. We'll see, this may end up a shorter dress later. It's very much still a work in progress. It has two darts in the back bodice and then features this gathered around the bust shaping, which I tried it on earlier for Andrew and he thinks it looks weird, but you know, he's a guy, what does he know about fashion? No offense to my male fashionistas. I love it. I think it's pretty. And the color is gorgeous. Love this red. Red is one of my favorite colors for clothing, in case you couldn't tell. I have more red fabric in stash too. I tend to go for dark colors, uh, reds, especially pops of reds, classics like navy, black, floral, stripes stuff like that, nothing too bright. So again, that's the Loon Dress by French Poetry Patterns. Um, I cut whatever the 36 inch is for the bust and whatever the 31 inch was for the waist. It's been working out perfectly. After sewing this, this is kind of what's alerted me to the fact that the Etoile dress is not an isolated incident in terms of like how well it fits for me. I think French Poetry Fit Models are just whatever their fit model is, it works really well for my body proportions. So I already own uh, the Orion shorts and I can never remember the Polaris top. It's like a gathered neckline top. Um, so I'll definitely be looking into buying more of their patterns. I think there's only one or two more that I don't already own, but I'll definitely be looking into buying more of their patterns in the future because 
their fit model just suits my body proportions like really, really well. And that's it for the garment sewing. I have one last project to show you and it's a home sewing project. I have been searching for a little bit now for a duvet cover in a color that I really want. It's like that, is it mauve, is it rust, is it brown kind of color. I'll insert a photo here of one that I saw that I just really, really liked, but I cannot find this color anywhere and something that's affordable. I'm sure that the, whoever made um, this particular one in this photo, they have it, but I looked it up and it was just way out of my price range. And it was sheets anyway, it wasn't a duvet cover. So I set to the internet to try to find the perfect color and I found this Robert Kaufman um, linen, Essex linen blend, it's like a yarn dyed one in the Red Rock color. Now you may notice, looking at it here, that this is quite a different color than the one of my inspiration photo. I tend to agree with you. I don't know what it was, but on screen it just looked really different than what ended up arriving. This is more of a like, is it rust, is it brown? It's not very much in the mauve kind of purple category, which I was hoping for. It's a really specific color that I have in my head, and I 100% admit that. But I'm going to sew it up anyway. I'll see if I like it. And if I don't, I'll purchase something later on. I don't want to waste it. So this is going to be our duvet cover. Um, of course, the width of the fabric, which is 56 inches, is not enough to be the entire width of a duvet cover needs to be. So I got enough to cut the length of the bed and then another length of the bed to then cut that in half and attach it to the sides on either side. So we have a really big piece that has a seam about a quarter of the way in on either side. And then from there, once I attach the back, or I guess before I attach the back because it's a duvet cover, um, I'm going to sew like a square, like another a horizontal line to kind of square off this right here. So I don't know if you can see that seam happening right here, but also like down enough to make it a square across the side so it looks more intentional. And that's my duvet cover project. Um, obviously I need the backing fabric, which I didn't have until recently. I decided to get a sheet. So I bought this from Amazon. It's a California king size in like this warm gray color so that I could use that as the backing fabric for the duvet cover. And then from there, I'll insert some ties into each corner so that I can attach um, our current comforter, like slip it in on the inside and attach the current comforter to the corners. I don't know if how that's gonna work. I, again, I watched a tutorial online. It seemed pretty straightforward. So hopefully that will work out. But yeah, that's my duvet cover project. I haven't made much progress on it lately because I've been waiting for this sheet to come in, and this just came in like last week or so, so I anticipate that I'll get back to it some point soon since I now have the sheet. So that is everything. I feel like I've been talking a lot. My voice is getting kind of hoarse actually from all the projects that I have to share with you, but I just wanted to like give you, like level out the playing field, show you all the things that I've kind of been making in recent um, weeks or so, just so you have an idea. And then I hope to see you again in a couple weeks. So thank you so much for watching this podcast. Massive thank you to uh, patrons for making this possible. If you want to support me over there, you may do so at www.patreon.com slash Jacqueline Salem. And with that, I will see you in the next episode. Bye.